So let me also state for the record, I never thought I was really good at remote viewing. I think remote viewing is frankly, it's a, it's a vestigial capability. I think most human beings can do it actually quite easily. Um, I always say, look, you know, you're out of town, you, you call your significant other because you have this urge to call them and they're like, oh my God, I was just thinking of you, right? And also, therefore, if the bureaucracy is set up so that everything's in cells, it makes it even more difficult to get through the various chains of commands, the need or the urgency to do certain things right. where you know the information and yet people above you who are assigned to make the decision Correct. don't. So I don't think there's any better example of this than what you allege in the book, which is that you had this thing called Operation Interloper yeah. where you wanted to basically set up a fucking – you know, master honey trap on involving one of your carriers out in the sea where a lot of transmedium UFOs are allegedly spotted to basically set up this enormous nuclear situation to try to draw into the mother load, if you will, yeah. whoever these beings are to come to the ship and you were going to use some sort of impetus to like clap them and, and collect the evidence. And in mm -hmm. the end, the government you know, through the chain of command, they said you can't do this. Yeah, so you're referring to the to the issue of compartmentalization, and you compartmentalize information because it's so sensitive. You want to risk any type of compromise to it, right? So you say oh, this is really, really secret. So X Y Z X Y Z. The problem is if it's overly compartmentalized, the information never gets to the person it needs to get to in the first place. And I'll, I'll, I'd like to quote real quick for Interloper, you're talking about it, by the way. Um, Jay was very helpful with that. He was really one of his masterminds. Yeah, he was one of his, his masterminds, him, and we, we put this together. Uh, but he really, he did a good job. It's a shame it didn't, it didn't get approved because it was really, it was phenomenal. Uh, he really did most of the heavy lifting on that. Um, so I'd like to quote from my, my friend, Chris Mellon. Um, Chris Mellon is a uh, from the Mellon family, the famous Mellon family. So think Carnegie Mellon. Uh -oh. uh, yeah, think of uh -oh. uh, Mellon Bank, Mellon University, right? Gulf Oil. Uh, he's an incredible human being, though, and he was uh, he was a senior staffer for uh, Bill Cohen, Senator Bill Cohen, and then later when Bill Cohen became the Secretary of Defense, he brought him with him to the Pentagon. He became the one of the senior most intelligence officials in in the De Department of Defense, and Chris. Always reminds me, um, even when I don't want to be reminded because he's, he's absolutely right. He says, uh, we didn't win the Cold War because we kept better secrets. The Russians did. We won the Cold War because we knew how to move information more efficiently mm. than the Russians. And he's absolutely correct. What does he mean by that? Well, classified information, if I collect information on X, Y, Z, and you're the guy who needs that information to do something with it, I have a way to get that information to you very quickly. And if you've got a colleague over there that needs that information, maybe parts X and Z, you know then how to get that information to him very quickly, right? So we start moving information very fast to actually do something with it, actionable, right? You don't just keep a secret for the sake of keeping a secret, because if it doesn't get to who it needs to get to, then it's useless. It, you're wasting your time and your money. Secret information is only valuable because you can do something with it when you need to, right? And this goes kind of through the conversation I've always said about secrets. Secrets, a lot of people think are like a fine wine where the longer you keep a cork on it, the better it gets. Um, and I disagree. I've always told people I think secrets have a shelf life. They're perishable. They're like vegetables in the refrigerator. Mm. And the longer you leave them in the refrigerator, at some point they're going to start to rot and they're going to stink. And then you're going to have a bigger mess on your hands to clean up. And so secrets are only as good – um, for the time that you need them and to get them to the people who need it, the information. Otherwise, you're, you're wasting your time and your money. There's no, there's no reason to have classified information or collect intelligence if you're not going to do anything with it. So that is part of my – with this – with the A-tip conversation – you need to have a single belly button and this is why Arrow was such a – I think such a pivotal moment for us for disclosure because now the government's recognizing, yes, we need a single – belly button. Now, can they do a better job? Yeah, I think we all agree they can do a lot better job, but they're getting there, I think. I think hopefully with this new director, we might start seeing some some new focus. So I'm very optimistic about that. But um, with something like Interloper, it was not in a place it needed to be, obviously, because you couldn't do it. Correct. The right people in the chain of command didn't know what was going on. And you can't talk about... We couldn't say UFOs. The, yeah, yeah, but I'm saying for the actual planned event you were doing... Correct me if I'm wrong here. It's it's classified information exactly how you were going to 
I can't discuss exactly correct. Right. I can't. I can't discuss the the the, the methodology. Um, I could probably go back to the Pentagon and request permission. Maybe I, sh I should. Yeah, let's do uh, that. You know. Let's get them on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> well, you dial them up. Bro. You got to go through DOP search. It's a little more complicated. <laughs> it, it took my book almost a year to get through that process, and it was like birthing an elephant. Um, and still, then they, they still redacted information. Believe it or not. Yeah, I, a little bit. I tried like hell, man, to keep that. I wanted the whole thing to go through, but um, it wasn't much though. There's yeah, a couple no names. It was, you know? Yeah. Well, no, there's, there was some, there and was then a significant, there were a couple pages. Yeah, where it was exactly. Black. Which is Wait, a shame. Wait, did they shorten that? Meaning, like, was it way more? Like, it it would black out like 15 lines, but was it really like you know 1500 lines? No, it was 15 lines. I made it exact. Okay. I, I wanted everybody to see exactly the portion they didn't want you to see. I did that on purpose. All because right. I want that's full transparency, right? I can't sit here and scream. I want government transparency if I'm not going to be transparent myself. Right. So, what you see is what you get. That book was put in, and what you see in, in those black lines is exactly the paragraph or the line or the names they did not want released. And I said, okay. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna leak information. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't in my opinion as some as just like a person reading. I didn't I didn't think it was like that much. There was there was one there I really wish they would have left in because it would have been an eye opener. Uh, but I can't. Oh, yeah, it was really. Me like it that? was. God, <laughs> I'm sorry, it, it's man. It's not remote viewing stuff, is it? No, no, no. Okay. It's it's a, a particular UAP incident that really was. You know, it would have definitely been another gold standard, but okay. they didn't want me talking about. All right, it. let's see if we can get it later. But the the remote <laughs> viewing thing is actually on on that note interesting because you you know you're making a big claim in there. You are also explaining within your book that you did some remote viewing yourself. Like when you found out this was a thing with Project Stargate, which allegedly had been shut down and all that with guys like Joe McMonagle. And for people out there, obviously remote viewing is the ability to be able to see things that are happening in another place at another time because you access, what is that thing called again? The PC in your brain? The oh, that's, the, yeah, the, the Cuarate Puramen. No, but that's, uh, the, yeah. The, you're talking Am about I mixing up Gary Nolan's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. A, that's okay. Okay, but either way, like you're able yeah. to do some wild shit. And there's also something about a lot of the people who are able to do this have some sort of blood that ties back to Cherokee Nation. Yeah, that was some of the, the analysis that was done by, by the medical professionals. And let me also state for the record, I never thought I was really good at remote viewing. I think remote viewing is, frankly, it's a, it's a vestigial capability. I think most human beings can do it actually quite easily. Um, I always say, look, you know, you're know, you out of town, you you call your significant other because you have this urge to call them. And they're like, oh my God, I was just thinking of you, right? Mm. Uh, it's it, it, I am, I am My own personal, which I don't like to do, but my own personal belief is that this is, it, it's nothing any anything woo woo it's just based in science probably quantum mechanics a lot of a lot of scientists now neurosurgeons and neuroscientists believe that human consciousness when i say consciousness i don't mean like the weird oh, you know world is a bud about the blossom i'm talking about the, the the cognitive ability of the human being outside of necessarily intelligence what what makes you you right not your body and not even your intelligence it's there's something else that's uniquely you that's and right. that's what we're calling call, call consciousness so that some neuroscientists are speculating it may be actually a form of quantum entanglement that occurs in the brain, um, and that is what is that is where that that lies that 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 self identity that that sentience, if you will. Um, it's possible that if that's the case, that remote viewing is a something we've always had for a very long time. Before we had the language skills that we have now and the ability to verbally communicate simultaneously in a language all around the world, um, you know, we didn't have that before. We were living in tiny little little villages and caves and whatnot. So when you came across another human being, there probably wasn't much of a spoken language and there probably wasn't much ability to communicate. So you had to be able to identify if something is a threatening or not. It's kind of like when two dogs walk into a room, when they first walk into a room, there's some sort of nonverbal communication that is occurring. And it's quite possible that this is nothing more than a vestigial capability left over when humans were much more basic and maybe relied upon it for survival. You know, this was a, a, a survival mechanism. You know, is that friend or foe? You know, am I going to be eaten or is he going to help me that's right. Catch a tiger. So um, the problem is that, you know, we always like to put labels on things, you know, and, and I used to give a, a little presentation where I would, I would kind of highlight that. I'd say, look, what is your, what is your, uh, what is your definition of when I say parachute, for example, and I'd show a picture of a parachute and um, I'd say, you know, what is para comes from the trunk. It's, it's a Latin prefix meaning above, meaning above or beside. And so when you say parachute, you think of a thing that shoots over your head and helps you hit the ground with a, with a, hopefully a thump and not a thud. Uh, and then I say, what does the word paramedic mean to you? And then, you know, people say, oh, it's first responders and it's a medic, you know, that's helping you. And, 
And then I usually ask people, what about paranormal? Mm. And then people will, see, you just did it right there. Mm, right? Some people will smile, kind of look at you kind of crazy. Hmm. You know why you did that? Because there is a stigma associated with the word paranormal. Now, I would submit to you the word paranormal is no different than parachute or paramedic. In fact, it just means um, something that is outside of our current understanding of what normal current is. Current understanding. Current. Right. In fact, I would tell you, I would submit to you that the definition of, of, of anything in science is paranormal till it becomes normal. My cell phone 40 years ago, absolutely paranormal, right? The electromagnetic spectrum, absolutely paranormal 150 years ago. Now it's routine, right? So we have created these artificial barriers in our understanding of what could just frankly just be advanced science. Um, but because we don't understand it, we stigmatize it yeah. with terms like paranormal, right? And then we have think of tinfoil hats and ghostbusters and things like that, when in reality, it may not be. It just may just be new science. And so we have to kind of limit that. And when you talk about remote viewing, people kind of put that into the paranormal category. I don't think it's paranormal at all. I think it's probably just some sort of quantum process in the brain. Yeah, I actually think your explanation here, this is one place where it was way better than in the book. Because in the book, I think maybe it's just how it gets written on the page sometimes. It made it seem like you had this superpower or something in, in some ways. And I think that's no, where people have yeah. criticized you. Yeah, and that's no, not I don't think so. Not at all. No, I think it's, 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 it, it, it's probably rudimentary. I think m most everybody has it to some degree. And I wasn't even particularly good at it. So I think once you understand how it works, then it gets were you a able easier. to recover? I forget. Were you able to recover like some sort of data? Wasn't there something involving like a terrorist that you were able to remote view into? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we got some guys. There was an ambush that was set up. I had some, some. You know, I don't want to get into it, but there's some, there's some people, colleagues of mine that were there for it and witnessed it. Um, how did you see that? You know, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, we, we could sit here for two hours yeah. and talk about it. There's other people that are way more qualified, like Joe McMonagall and and uh, some of these, you know, Ingo Swan and some other folks that are, you know, who you should have is probably Hal Pudoff because he was the godfather of the remote viewing I program. I will be he, very excited he, to he's get the, Hal He's Pudoff. the guy to have. Um, he is the godfather of it. He actually- uh, I'll drive him here myself. Created it for the CIA and then later on, uh, DI when it was called Grill Flame and some other names before that, before it became Stargate. Um you know, I would often ask him later on in my career, we would, he would ask me, I would tell him things that we would do and, you know, uh, ask him to tell you about the, uh, about the Metro, DC Metro incident. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll like let that. him tell you that. Say, hey, Hal, Lou told me to ask you about when he told you about the 90 days and the, and the DC Metro issue and yeah. then see if he remembers that, yeah. Now, Lou, I'd say I have one more question for you, but that's a lie. But I only have one more question for you strictly because I have to get you the hell out of here in a couple. Okay. Um, I'm a Gemini. I like long walks on the beach and uh, <laughs> pina coladas. That's what you're going to ask, isn't it? No. But we, I, I want to, if, if we can, I, I'll talk to you off camera afterwards. I want to get you back here in November because there's a lot, including that last topic right there, that we got to go deeper into. And, of course, I'd love to talk without put off. That would be incredible. But, you know, you talk about still being religious yourself and being mm -hmm. you, the word you use in your book is, is, is spiritual. And now you've had access to so many things that relate directly to the meaning of life. So through it all, do you, as it currently stands, do you believe in God? Absolutely. Um, I think I think knowledge reinforces it might religion. Uh, it might it might modify a little bit of our interpretation. Look, information doesn't threaten God. All it does is threaten our understanding of God. And there's a difference, right? There's a big difference here. It's like when the church with Galileo, oh, you're going to be, so the fact that you're saying that the earth is not the center of the solar system, you're going to be going against religion. No, actually what you're doing is you're reinforcing the notion of the, of the preeminence of, 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 of something bigger and greater and that the universe is much more complex than we could off, ever possibly can comprehend. Um, and that's been my experience. This hasn't threatened my, my spirituality at all. In fact, it's reinforced it significantly. Wow. Yeah. All right. We're going to have to dig into that next time. Thank you so much for doing this. I, I really appreciate the fact that, you know, you have answered a lot of tough questions today as well. No, nope, my own and privilege. I'm still, I'm still going to keep some of my skepticism, but there's other things that I, I think you have really good arguments hey, for. Hey, healthy skepticism is important. I, I'm not asking you not to be skeptical about things. I'm asking you not to be a skeptic. There's mm. a big difference. Healthy skepticism is important because it takes it takes all sides to have the conversation. Agreed. You know, and I think the fact that we can do this here in a civil way, respectful of each other, 
is proof that, you know, some of the folks in the community can do the same thing, you know, and stop throwing arrows at each other and, and, and being petty. Let's, let's, Fuck yeah. let's work together, right, as much as we possibly can. Let's focus on the 80% of the stuff that we agree on and maybe table the 20% that we don't. Fair enough. Well, Lou, thank you so much. My I'll honor see, privilege, brother. I'll see you again soon. Congratulations on the book and all the success. Well deserved. Thank you. Everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace and please subscribe. Thank you guys for watching the episode. Before you leave, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. It's a huge help. And also, if you're over on Instagram, be sure to follow the show at Julian Dory Podcast or also on my personal page at Julian D. Dory. Both links are in the description below. Finally, if you'd like to catch up on our latest episodes, use the Julian Dory Podcast playlist link in the description below. Thank you. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.